Hi, this is Zoe, and this is the Zoe Rath Leadership Podcast, and welcome to the series on points of view. I'm really thrilled about today's guest, Dan Gregory. Dan is one of the most intelligent, witty, and insightful people I have ever met. He's a speaker, author, and social commentator. He is the co-founder of the Impossible Institute, along with his colleague, Kieran Flanagan, and that is a strategic think tank founded to reimagine the way we think, lead, navigate change, and create success. They have co-authored their latest book, Forever Skills, which is fan bloody tastic. And you might have seen Dan on the show, The Gruen Transfer, where he was one of the commentators on marketing and the evils of such things, <laughs> the evils and smarts of such things. He says he helps smart people be people smart. So in this particular interview, we dive into some of the concepts in Forever Skills, and we talk broad and deep about what it means to lead effectively in a volatile, uncertain uh, environment that we're in today. So buckle up and enjoy. I'm speaking with Dan, and Dan is dialing in from the Qantas Business Lounge on his way to Wellington. So I've managed to capture him mid-flight and I'm really thrilled to have this interview. I loved the book Forever Skills, and I'm very keen to dive into a little bit of that and your experience and expertise with businesses around the world. So welcome, Dan. Thanks, Zoe. Great to be a part of it. So this book, I was surprised and delighted as I opened it up and dived in. The amount of research and, and um, breadth of consideration that went into this book is that what you planned when you started out or did it kind of morph into some into a bigger and bigger project as you got into it? I think it always started out as a project we knew that we'd need to do a lot of research into. And in fact, the way the book was originally constructed, the three appendices at the end, which essentially outline where we looked for information, originally started out as the first three chapters in the book. And what we did was we, in looking at forever skills, we figured that they should be consistent throughout history. So we went and we had a look in ancient history and more recent history. And we were looking for what are the, the skills that have always mattered. And we went all the, all the way back to Mesopotamia, Persia, ancient Egypt, ancient China, the Americas. And, and then we you know, looked at more Renaissance Europe. That was kind of the first of the appendices. The second of the appendices was more about what are the, the workplace trends that we're seeing all around the world currently. And then finally, we looked at futurists and economists and people who were really good at uh, or had a reputation for, for predicting what was going to matter most in the future. And what we, what we tried to find was a through line in the research that would be, would be useful to people. You know, if they were, our view is if they're forever skills, then they should have been around forever and they've just, um, they've just taken on, a, on different roles in our lives as, as we've moved forward. So obviously your premise is that they have been around forever. And what surprised you the most as you did your research? Did you change your perspective? Did you have a hypothesis to start with? And did your perspective change through the research? Yeah, absolutely. We, we definitely had a hypothesis. And there was, there was a lot of, um, you've probably seen, you know, the World Economic Forum's prediction for 2015 to 2020 skills. And there's, there's certainly a shift. We were figuring something that, that there'd be something similar. Um, but I think the thing that was most surprising to us it was no one identified hard skills. No one picked any technical skills at all. We thought for sure someone was going to say, what about coding? We've got to teach our kids how to code. And that didn't come up at all, which was interesting. What people found was the skills that mattered the most were what we technically think of as soft skills or people skills and also creative skills. But the other thing that was interesting about that was they were also the skills that people identified as taking them from being really good at their job, in other words, a very competent professional, to being a capable leader. So that, that was interesting too. It wasn't just that these were the skills that would matter to you at a professional level, but, but also that they were the, the transitional skills that helped you become a better leader as well. So creativity, communication, and control were the three meta skills, I guess, the meta forever skills. Yep. Do you prioritize any one of those three above the other, or do they just work in concert? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, no, we, we didn't prioritize those. I mean, what we looked for is, is we were looking for a mnemonic that would make it mem memorable. And control is probably an imperfect uh, word beginning with the letter C, but it really encapsulated a lot of what 
those skills were things like self-control, resource management, and ability to establish a sense of social or organisational order, a sense of right and wrong, you know, consensus around around what morality should look look like. Um, but all of the skills were were seen as as critically important. And what what we saw was the emphasis shifted from industry to industry, and even from culture to culture. However, the those three big buckets were were pretty much universal. And I guess the other thing that was really surprising was words that we thought were quite easy to understand or, or made sense universally didn't make sense universally. People had multiple definitions of words. So words like resilience seems like a really universal word, but people meant lots of different things when they said resilience. And, and leadership, obviously, is another one where there's a huge breadth of expression in terms of what people mean by leadership and what characterises good leadership. So, so I think that was another thing that was interesting too, was not so much that there were buckets of skills that were, had primacy over others, but rather there were groups of skills that were more applicable in certain industries and in certain contexts than others. And also people had their own definitions of what those skills were. And how do you define leadership, just while we're on that topic? Great question. Um, <laughs> Everybody struggles with that one. <laughs> do you know, I was asked this on stage the other day. I was part of a panel. And, um, and we were talking about leadership. And, you know, people were saying stuff like, oh, it's the ability to, to set a vision and to set a cause. Some people said it was the ability to move people to action. But I think the thing for me that really defines leadership is a willingness and a capability to make the ugly decision when necessary. And I think that's what really defines leadership because setting a vision is actually reasonably easy and engaging people is reasonably easy, but a willingness to make an unpopular decision or make a decision that might put people you like in some sort of jeopardy, that's a hard thing to do. And I've, you know, I've worked a lot with different military leaders and and they're kind of the, the stretch test of what leadership is. You know, they, under certain circumstances, uh, have to decide, well, I'm going to send these hundred soldiers to their deaths in order to win a greater victory. And that's a really tough decision to make. And that's, you know, not a decision most of us have to make. But I think it's analogous to, you know, the, the, the military style of leadership is analogous to to business leadership when you think of, well, I've got to downsize part of an organisation or lose staff that I like in order to save the organisation as a whole. Um, and even though that's not a life and death thing, it can certainly feel like that to the people that you're, you're dealing with. And I think the, the stress and the uh, emotional angst that, that can cause in a leader is really what, what defines you. Can you make the tough calls when necessary? I think there's one step before that, and it is can you do the thinking that makes sure that you make the best decision possible that leads to the hard decisions. Because you can make hard decisions without doing the thinking. And I think um, there's an element of that that needs to be included, I think. I think that's true. I think that's true. Um, uh, but, I, but I also think it's one of the reasons why um, people who test very highly on the dark triad, on the psychopathy scale, do well in CEO positions because they're able to detach from an outcome and make decisions that aren't um, clouded by emotion. It's an interesting correlation, right? That whole research around the psychopaths and CEO relationship. And uh, I think from my understanding of that research is that they have very little empathy. Um, is that your definition or is that your understanding of that research? Yeah, I, th I think so. And it, they also do well in, in, in roles like being a test pilot or something where you need to be able to shut down uh, I don't think it's necessarily that psychopaths don't feel emotion as much as they feel emotion in a very narrow band. And I think you're right. I think the the empathy type of of emotion, you know, where you're able to to feel another's pain, even though it's not your own, it's actually a really good thing to have. But it can actually be uh, an impediment when you need to make decisions quickly or decisions that are um, particularly vexing and have you fear for the pain that you might cause others. So, I mean, I, mean, I think that's a quite, a, um, quite a dark definition of leadership. However, I also think it's the thing that perhaps 
it's when leadership becomes most important. Like it's easy to be a leader in good conditions. Um, I think it's, you know, what really defines you as a leader is how you respond when things aren't going quite so well. Mm. I agree with that. And I think you're right. Like it's easy to lead when things are going well and sucks when they aren't. So how are leaders that you work with doing against these forever skills? Do you find that the majority have them or are aware of them or are developing them or are there big gaps in contemporary leaders at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there are some big gaps. And really, there, there are gaps in all of those buckets. I mean, particularly in, you know, creative skills. We've, we've been talking about the need for, you know, creative problem solving, better critical thinking, transformational leadership, um, which is really where Kieran my business partner spends most of her time playing. However, we've been really poor in developing those skills. And then if you think about communication skills, which I guess is where I spend a little bit more of my time, you know, there's a real weakness there as well. One of the things that's interesting, I do a lot of work all around the world. And if I, if I get up in front of a North American audience and I give a speech and then I say, so are there any questions at the end? Every hand in the room goes up. If I ask that question to an, of an Australian audience, um, no one puts a hand up. They all avoid eye contact and look at their shoes and, 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 and hope I don't pick on them. And so there's something very interesting culturally. Here. And, and again, you, that's kind of reflected in Southeast Asia as well. So there's something culturally going on about it, um, the different, uh, different cultures have a different level of willingness to engage in communication and put themselves out there. So I think that, I think the gaps in the schools are cultural, but I also think they're organisational and industry-based as well. Some industries uh, do better in terms of creativity and, and control and, um, and communication, and others, others do less well. And I think if you think about control as one of the dimensions of control as being self-leadership, I, I think if you have a look at the rise in the awareness of mental health, in all industries in the past five years to a decade, I think that's an indication that we've been doing pretty poorly on, on that, that dimension of, of control historically as well. And where do you think the Aussies are sitting? Where do we think Aussies are doing well and where's the gap for Aussies? Yeah, good question. Again, it's different by industry. So a lot of, one of the interesting things about Australian industry is if you work for a large Australian corporation, you get a different kind of leader than if you do work with a large multinational corporation where you're less likely to have a founder CEO or you're less likely to have a CEO who's been part of the building of the organisation and they're more like they're running a regional branch of with a head office, say, in North America or Europe or Asia. And I think that requires a different style of leadership to someone who might be more if someone's come up in the organization and it's australian based and it's been built here the c-suite executives in that group are typically more entrepreneurial and a little bit more open to risk in their decision making than say a, a multinational ceo who's reporting to an executive team and a board in a foreign city and i think it's very different when you've got a startup ceo so someone who's an entrepreneur who's built a business and scaled it you know they've got a very different appetite for risk and a very different very different view of of culture and the way they each engage their staff is quite different because the the professional opportunities are different as well yeah that's an interesting thing the diversity in industries and their approach and and backgrounds how it plays into it and all your book, your entire book is layers of complexity and trying to find patterns in it, which is a hallmark of advanced leadership maturity. And not a lot of leaders sit in that layers of complexity and see through it. I'm curious about your take on history in the future. So diving into the book, you went back to, are these skills consistent through history? So you took a long view past and then you looked at the future. So what are the predictions and took a long view forward? How do you see the past informing the future and the future informing the present? Like where are those layers coming together for you? And more importantly, how do you stay on top of all that? If you're an individual leader in a particular sector? Oh, wow. Uh, tough. Um, I mean, I'm a bit of a history nerd. So uh, um, again, reading up on history is sort of my bag. So I actually really enjoy that. And, and to be honest, just consuming information generally, I probably read anywhere between 200 and 300 books a year most of those will be audio books 
So I'm, I'm constantly filling my head with information. I think my superpower, if I have one, is a capacity to synthesize information and look for what's, what's consistent and what's useful. But I think one of the core findings in the book was, was this idea that we look at change in a really narrow band. You know, we're very obsessed with what is changing. And that's probably gets, that gets 90% of our attention saved. Uh, those of us who are more entrepreneurial or, or innovators tend to look at what needs changing. But where we seldom focus is on what's unchanging. That's really the core thought in the book. And what we found from looking at change initiatives, you know, executed by leaders all around the world is the thing that makes a change initiative most likely, likely to succeed is a capacity to link the change to what's already familiar. In other words, to not make the change so all-encompassing that I have no sense of confidence or competence around it, but rather to structure it in such a way that I can feel like I can get an easy win. And I think that's, you're right, there is a level of complexity in the book, but I think if, if we want to you know, make the complicated simple, I think that's what's really going on, is just broadening our view of change so that our, our insights are more complete and not so driven around by panic. I think that's good. So looking to what's consistent and stable instead of what's fluctuating is a way of reducing the panic. With this view to history and the future, Dan Sullivan of Strategic Coach talks about 25-year plans and intentions. What's your perspective on that? I think it's optimistic. Having said that, I think you know China's probably running 100-year strategies at the moment, which is why they've got a, a lot of swagger in the way they move. You know, they're, they're quite happy for democracies running on three-year terms to run around and and not make particularly strategic solutions because they have to appease um, not particularly well-educated voters. Whereas get, given that they're not, not a democracy and they don't have to be elected, all they need to do is, is suppress dissent, uh, which they've been quite good at. But I think that they are able to take longer-term plans. And in some ways, it allows them to, to be more active on something like climate change than a democracy because if, for instance, it turned out that Australia had to switch from coal power to renewable power within a three-year period, that would mean that a significant number of people employed by mining and associated industries would lose their jobs. And that's not going to win you an election. Not that I'm saying that necessarily has to happen, but I'm saying that's an example of how the need to win a popular vote puts you in a position where you don't always make the most strategic decision. So I think it's a really interesting place to play. Um, and this idea of a 25-year strategic plan, I think you can make a value-based strategic plan, Zoe, rather than a product or service-based strategic plan in the long term. So if you think about Kodak, you know, Kodak lost their business because they went all in on film technology. What they should have gone in on was memory preservation, which is actually what their value exchange with their customers and clients was. And memory preservation is a multi-billion dollar industry, but it's value-based, not necessarily product or technology-based. In other words, the, the way they provide memory preservation will change as technology and history changes. However, that's a universal need that will always be something that human beings and organisations that we're a part of will have to focus on. And even at a governmental level, I mean, Kodak should be the vault for national treasures, for the recording of languages that will soon be extinguished. You know, if they had a value lens on their 25 or 50 year projection, that would have taken them in a very different direction in terms of innovation rather than just making better quality film. And I think that that's a, um, that's a different lens. So I think, yes, you, this, the 25-year plan is, is a good thing to have at a, a value-based level, not necessarily at a technology or product-based level, because I think that stuff's really hard to predict. Well, that's right. And that sort of speaks to what you said in your research, is that people didn't say learn this particular technical skill because it's also volatile and changing. And it's more these soft skills, these people skills, that are the things that are going to guide us through Variations. I love the fact that you use a values lens as as a filter for looking at long term or even short term decisions. Oh, absolutely. Really? I mean, yeah, yeah. And it's funny. I mean, I I don't have kids. Kieran's little girl is my goddaughter, and, and so I'm kind of exposed to the world of children through her. And you know, speaking to parents, you know, parents say stuff like, "Oh, I've got to teach our kids to code." You know, and I'll say stuff like, "Well, I can code in COBOL because I learned how to code in the 1990s." No one codes in COBOL anymore. However, the universal skill, the transferable skill is, 
can I sequence information in, can I think in terms of if then statements, can I, can I essentially use the universal skills of coding and then apply that in other places? So, uh, you know, a, a prehistoric form of coding is a recipe for a meal. You know, it teaches you a particular sequence of ingredients have to be added and a whole bunch of if then statements. If the water boils, here's what you change. And I think that that's, that universal or transferable skill is actually really useful, but the specifics of it will probably change as time changes. And, and also as, you know, we're looking at AI and um, algorithmic technology that is becoming not necessarily self-aware, but has the capacity to self-code and invent a language that's more efficient than any language we could write. And I think what we'll see is increasingly technical computer skills will become less technical and more intuitive in the way they're, they're designed and executed. I hope so, because <laughs> there's a lot of speak geek and a lot of stuff still yeah, but, for me anyway. But, I think there's a, but if you have a look at it, I mean, if you think back to 1994 when, when Apple launched the Mac, and the very first the, the very first ad that Apple ran was, uh, the headline was a computer for the rest of us. And in the, in the copy for the ad, it was a newspaper ad, it said, if computers are so smart, what if instead of teaching people how to work with computers, we taught computers how to work with people? So again, that's a value lens. You know, Apple's value lens was, was not about design, was not about, you know, being different. It was about how do you design humanly intuitive technology? And every success they've had has been built on that, whether it be the visual operating system, whether it be the iPod wheel, whether it be Siri voice activation, wherever they reduce the friction between the human being and the digital interface, that's where they were successful. And if you look at their product failures, it's when they, they broke that. So the Apple Newton, which worked like a Palm Pilot, where you had to learn your own, a different style of handwriting so that the Newton could understand what you were saying. So in other words, it increased the friction between the human being and the digital interface. That was one of their failures. So I think, again, even for someone like Apple, who's very technically aware, having a value lens was more important than the technical lens. So thinking of lenses, I'm curious about worldview. And a lot of the research you would have done, we look at how different industries and different leaders look at the world and themselves. I'm curious about your own worldview. Do you put a self-conscious lens on to explore how you are seeing and thinking the world, seeing and thinking about the world? Uh, what do you mean by a self-conscious lens? Like, do you explore your own interpretation of what you're seeing? So do you challenge your own perspectives? Do you challenge your own values about your beliefs around leadership or the world or service, that kind of thing? Oh, yeah, very much. I think, you know, arguing is probably my one true skill. Um, and, I, and I apply it not just to other people. I, it, it, I mean, it's funny, if you ask Kieran, she will probably tell you that I enjoy conflict more than any other human being she knows. Um, but it's also, it's also an internal conflict. I, I'm very questioning, and I, I think in a very dialectical way. You know, uh, you know, I kind of use that old Socratic method of arguing both sides. Uh, and interesting, Kieran and I were speaking to Will Anderson, the stand-up comedian, uh, recently, and he was saying he he kind of does the same. He sets up people to argue with in his mind, and he when he does stand up comedy, he will first argue for the case he doesn't actually believe in. Um, and what it does is it is it allows people who don't necessarily agree with him to to actually hear his message and buy in to some extent. Um, and then he'll argue the other side. And, um, and of course, you know, he sets up straw man that he can be because it's his show. But I think that it's, uh, I think it's a useful tool. Even if you're trying to be persuasive with someone, it's, it's useful to understand what are the arguments they're going to use against what, what your position is. And what that does is it allows you to be less defensive and more, more fluid in the way you communicate. So I think that's a really important skill. It actually expands your capacity to see complexity and paradox and increases compassion too. Well, I think we're also statistically quite likely to be wrong a lot of the time. And none of us think about it. You know, I mean, I, I quite often make the joke on stage about if we think about average in terms of the mean, 50% of the human population was in the bottom half of the class. But then if we think about the median, the, the average person, well, typically we standardise average at 65%, which means the average person gets one in three decisions wrong. And that's a pretty low, 
that's pretty terrible. success rate. Yeah, exactly. And and again, I'm playing with statistics a bit to you know really to make a point. And the point is that almost none of us think we're wrong. Uh, and even you know even when Kieran and I argue with each other, you know she'll say, "You always think you're right." I'm like, "Yeah, everyone always thinks they're right." If if I thought I was wrong, I wouldn't bother arguing. Um, <laughs> and and I think that that's it's it's good to be reminded of that is is how often we're wrong, even if we're really experienced and really knowledgeable, we're we're wrong a lot of the time. And I think there's there's one of my um one of my heroes when I first started my advertising career, so you know thirty odd years ago, was Bill Burnback. There's a lot of a lot of myth around Bill Burnback. He was one of the original Mad Men from Madison Avenue. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, and he had a, a slip of paper in his top suit pocket that read, they might be right. So, yeah, it was just really about keeping conscious that, you know, there are opinions on the other side of the table and on the other side of the argument. And, you know, at a flip of a coin, we're all probably right half the time and the other side's probably right half the time, and yet we all act as if we're 100% right 100% of the time. And a lot of the reading I've been doing recently has it's got neuroscience behind it saying it feels really good to be right. Like it gives us a boost of dopamine to have that conviction. One of the reasons why we get stuck into it. Have you read the book, The Intelligence Trap by Dave Robson? No, I haven't. It, it's really good. So it's all about how smart people do dumb things. And a lot of it's uh, neuroscience um, and talks about hacks to, to change that. So I'll send you a little uh, link to that oh, book. Perfect. I'm going to be interviewing Dave in a couple of weeks. So yeah, it was a brilliant book. I actually studied this one. It's one of the few books I sit down and study. And I really studied this one in terms of looking at how our brains don't serve us that well. And one of the ones they, one of the solutions that you've just offered is of course, is to argue the other side. And I think that's uh, one of the things that he points to as well to prevent us from believing we're right. And I think, do you know, failing miserably. I think, it, I think we've probably got a lot of overlap in the work that we do. I mean, one of the things I say is I, I help smart people be people smart. And one of my observations is smart people would rather be right than rich, or they'd rather be right than win, or rather rather be right than effective. And I see it a lot. You know, we're so in love with our rightness that it becomes righteousness, and it gets in the way of success. Uh, and, you know, so I work with a lot of you know smart people, engineers, scientists, lawyers, and the the problem with smart people is they think being right matters, or they think it should matter. Yeah, maybe they're right, maybe it should matter, but it doesn't. You know, I mean, if you've only got to look at elections where, you know, people who aren't necessarily smart but are good at being persuasive will win the election or people who didn't do well at school or university or didn't even attend university will do well in business versus someone who got top grades. And I think that there's, um, I think it's very easy to fall in love with the fact that we're right and assume that's all we need to be. And I think the big gap is... Again, coming back to the communications thing, the the people that win are the ones who can build the most engagement around their cause or their product or their business, not necessarily the best product or the most qualified applicant who wins in the game. And I think that that's a really interesting, that's an interesting place to play. And look, it certainly keeps me busy. So I'm quite happy for smart people to be a little bit people stupid because it pays my mortgage. Um, I love it. Uh, well, there's no shortage of, of smart people being people dumb. That's for sure. That's my work as well. I help really smart people learn the ins and outs of working with those tricky objects, human beings. Um, speaking of, you, you read a lot, like two to 300 books a year. That's, I have to come back to that. Like, that's amazing. So you, you say you typically listen to it on audiobooks. What are your other strategies to absorb that much Intel. Okay. What, um, what I do is I will read um, a book summary, at least one book summary a day. So they might be, you know, 10 pages long. So someone like, like Get Abstract, I read a lot of, and that will tell me what to go deeper into. And then audio books, I'll, I'll get through, I don't know, two or three a week, just because I travel so much and I'll, I'll, I'll just put an audio book on. And then I'll read, I'll, I'll kind of speed read full books looking for so if I, if there's a particular book somewhere that i've really enjoyed and i want to go in and get, get a little bit more academic about what's in the book i'll kind of speed read those as well for a little bit more depth i think my default is um kieran and i talk about rather than 
personality archetypes, which is, which is always, they're always framed as a fait accompli. Like you're an INTJ and you will forever be an INTJ or, or you're a D and you will forever be a D or, you know, whatever frame it is. And I think that, I think that can be somewhat limiting. I, Kieran and I tend to talk about default thinking frames. And in other words, there's a style of thinking you tend to prefer or lean on most heavily, particularly under stress or duress. It doesn't mean that's the only way you can think, but it's what your default is. And I think my default is information. So I will always look for precedent or something that's been written or a study that's been done before I reach out to people in my network, before I reach out to my own imagination, before I take action. And in, in fact, I'm, you know, I think it's probably, um, uh, it's a strength, but it's also a weakness. Because I, I think that's the other thing. We talk about strengths and weaknesses as if they're, as if they're binary, but they're actually not. They're, they're really positive and negative. So I, I guess the negative of that for me is, is I have a tendency to procrastinate. In fact, Kieran's little girl bought me a uh, pencil case for my speaker, speaker gear the other day that, that said, hang on, let me overthink this. Uh, so so even, <laughs> even at 11 years of age, she's got me pegged. Um, Although I did see a good defense of procrastination the other day. It said, um, I don't procrastinate. I leave my decisions to the very last second when I will be older and therefore wiser. So I'm, I'm going to use that defense from now on. But, but yeah, I think that, you know, it's, I'm, I'm, I, uh, I have a huge appetite for information and, um, and obviously most of what I read, you know, most of what I read is in business books is psychology, sociology, philosophy it's really anything that touches on the business of human behavior what makes us do what we do that's i mean that's eternally interesting for me yeah me too i've got to upgrade my speed reading though because i'm not getting through nearly as many books as that um so that's inspired me that's for sure so i have a couple of just short questions we'll see how short they are to finish up um bit of fun so a favorite professional crush have you got one do you know, I was thinking about that earlier, and I'm not sure I do, but I think Bill Burnback was when I started my career. Bill Burnback, who I mentioned earlier, simply because he was, um, you know, I mean, I haven't worked in advertising for almost 10 years now, but when I was, you know, 21 and going into the advertising industry, he was really the person that I think most inspired me in terms of he was all about understanding what drove people and gave it a commercial edge as well, which, which you know, there's a lot of social psychologists I read. Like, I'm reading a lot of Jonathan Haidt's stuff at the moment, who's terrific, um, but he's got a little bit more of a moral psychology edge. Be more, he's a little bit more political, I'm a bit more commercial, I guess. And I think that's what really interests me about, um, about Bill Burnback. And I, I guess, you know, you know, back in the days when I was working as a stand-up comedian, there were different comedians that... Um, that I loved. I mean, George Carlin was always my hero, simply because he was so contrary and would, would just, there was nothing he liked more than barbecuing some sacred cow. And again, it's that, you know, he's, the, he's kind of the person that said, you know, we shouldn't teach our kids what to think. We should teach them to question everything. And I think that that's really a very serious message that George Carlin brought to stand up comedy. That's always, always stuck with me. And I'm, I'm, you know, one of the things Kieran and I have trained people to do is to think in questions rather than statements because a lot of the decisions we make aren't being made by us at all. They're, they're pre-made by our background, our experience or, or our context and actually an ability to question what we think is really important. Wonderful. Books are obviously really important to you as they are to me, Having being an author and, and soaking up as much authorship from other people as possible. Has there been a specific book that changed your perspective? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I was kind of a, you know, working class kid, worse than suburbs of Sydney. I was the first person in my family that went to university. And I remember when I wanted to get into advertising, like I knew no one in that world. And I called Simon Reynolds, who was kind of the most famous guy in advertising in the late 1980s. He did the Grim Reaper AIDS commercial. And I called him every day for six months and I finally got in to meet him. And he gave me a copy of Think and Grow Rich, which no was the way. first, yeah, which was the first of that um, success or self-improvement genre book that I'd ever seen. I mean, I didn't even know that kind of thinking existed. So 
he gave it to me and he said, read this 10 times. And I took it away and I just, I just read it. And it was like, it was just such a different way of thinking compared to, to anything I'd been, I'd been exposed to. Uh, and what was interesting was I actually noticed that, you know, when you travel from the Western suburbs of Sydney to the lower North Shore or the Eastern suburbs of Sydney, which are more affluent areas, the kind of books and even the kind of, um, uh, the kind of genres of books they stopped were completely different. Oh my God, that's really, that's really telling, isn't it? Um, and you see a lot of books in airports in different airports around the world. Do you see different styles of books that occur or is it sort of just the same through airports? Uh, a lot of it's the same. You know, there's some, some cultural differences as well. And, and, and one of the great things is, is we get to do business with organisations all around the world and Australian organisations versus Chinese versus Singaporean versus Indian versus American versus multinational they all behave quite differently. And a lot of the work that Kieran and I have done over the years is, is with multinational organisations and helping them develop a, um, a code or a, a language that they can use to talk to each other and, and be understood. I, I mean, I think one of, the, one of the challenging things about communication across culture is we tend to process communication as information transmission rather than both of us moving to a shared sense of understanding. And I think that, that oftentimes you see a lot of, conflict within organizations like we were working with a tech company with the asia pacific region which went from dubai all the way through central asia southeast asia australia new zealand on the west coast of the united states and you had team leaders in all of those different countries who even though they all spoke english and that was the common language they had they weren't speaking a common language at all they were all filtering it to their own value systems and what we did with them was we gave them a way of filtering the language based on intent in other words we gave them a way of understanding how one person was communicating versus another person and we even went to the extent where we we got them to color code the text in their emails which denoted the kind of emotion or the kind of filter you should use in reading it and what it did was it just you know escalated the understanding between the different departments and the different groups in the organization because they're actually all on the same side and really wanted to work well together they just didn't have a tool that was based on understanding and so we, we do a lot of work around that and, I, and that's i find that really really rich i mean again you know language is just one of the ways human behavior manifests and um i, I was working with a, a friend of mine who's the md of a, a german medical technology company and, you know, she and I were having, she invited me to speak to her leadership team and we're sitting in her office before I spoke to them and her phone rang and, and it was her dad on the phone who was out from Germany. And so she had a conversation in German and she said, look, Dan, I know you understand German. And that was my father on the phone. And I've just, he's out from Germany. He's looking after my kids. And I've just had to explain to him that sometimes when an Australian tradesperson makes an appointment, not often are they almost always late. Sometimes they do not show up at all. And it was more than his German brain could comprehend. And we talked about the fact, the, the hierarchy of language. Like in Australia, you say, hello, my name is Dan, or my name is Zoe, and I'm, I'm the carpenter. In German, you say, hello, I'm the carpenter, Dan. In other words, the hierarchy of your professionalism sits above your, your individuality. And so th that's one of the things I like about language is language is a way of codifying our values and ascribing hierarchy based on the order of the words that we use. So you'll often find in Japanese, I think, I think it's Japanese where the verb is at the end of the sentence. So you actually don't know the direction that the conversation's going until the very end. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so there's, uh, I, I find language really interesting. And even, even if we're speaking a common language, I mean, I mean, you're, you're Canadian, right? And so you're, your version of English is different to Australian English, is different to, you know, the rest of North America is different to the UK. And those little differences, even though we understand each other perfectly well, those slight differences in the mnemonics we use and the, the inflections we use change the way that we communicate. Even humour. It's interesting. Australian humour is like Scottish humour. In other words, typically we'll insult you first and then based on how well you react to it, will decide if you're a good person or not. But if you do that to a Canadian or an American, like if you insult them, they take it really seriously and they're really offended. So 
you know, Australians will often get themselves into trouble in North America because we'll open with something that feels like a slap. Um, so even stuff like that is really, I find that stuff fascinating and endlessly interesting. It was certainly my experience arriving in Australia where I got teased mercilessly for my accent for, for ages until I couldn't take it anymore. And it was something that I found, it was weird. And until I worked out, oh yeah, it's just a different sense of humor. And um, I had to tell people, you know, Canadians don't do sarcasm. So, you know, if you're going to be sarcastic, just assume I'm taking you at your word oh, <laughs> because I don't get it. We went, we went to a wedding with one of the guys who, who used to work with Kieran and I, he and his wife are very good friends of ours. And um, we went to their wedding. This is probably two decades ago now. And she had been an exchange student in Canada and her Canadian family came out. And I, of course, opened with a joke. I went, oh, God, you know, I, I love Canadians. You're just like Americans with no ambition. And and they, they <laughs> 20 years later, they are still offended. They still talk about, you know, that friend Dan who was really rude to them. And, <laughs> and, and again, and, you know, I, I should have thought, you know, that, I was I was in the moment and I was trying to be funny, um, but but yeah, it was it it caused great offence. But but again, I think that's one of the things. I, one of the things I loved about doing stand-up comedy again is that's an experiment in human behaviour as well. I think what defines the culture is what makes you laugh and what makes you angry, and sometimes those things flip as you cross from one border, to, you know, to another country. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, I can imagine because all you needed to do to flip that around is like you're just like Americans except you're much nicer and have better food or something like that but I'm not the comedic expert <laughs> no do you know what I saw a Canadian and uh he was doing a routine and he said um oh everyone thinks we're the nice Americans right but we're not he said because I know what we say about Americans when they're not listening he said <laughs> whereas Americans they're genuinely nice and I thought that was a really interesting take on on Canadians being the nice ones too. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Canadians love to hate on Americans, that's for sure. <laughs> I think that's you know that's true of the Irish and the English, the the Kiwis and the Australians. You know, I'm going to New Zealand today, so I'm going to have to self-deprecate Australia to win some points over there. Oh yeah, for sure, because Australia's big brother to poor old Kiwis, and they don't take kindly to it, do they? No, no. Dan, it's been an absolute delight uh, talking with you this afternoon. I really appreciate it. Um, to leave us, what what's your biggest tip for leaders? Like, if walk away, of course they need to read your latest book, which is awesome. What's the biggest thing they can take away? Do you know what? That's a great question. I've just turned 50, and I think I'm still coming to terms with the idea of don't spend so much time trying to be someone else. Figure out who you are and how that works the most critical lesson for leaders and it's taken me 30 years in business and I'm still learning this is to stop trying to be everyone else and figure out who you are. I think the, the, the most important work you ever do is, is around self-awareness and understanding yourself. Thanks very much. I love it. I think the journey of self-awareness is something that we're on continually and you've been a huge asset to us to learn about ourselves and the world and how we can be better at doing both. Thanks. Thanks, Zoe. So much fun to talk to you.